All right, hello and good morning. Thank you for tuning in to the Phase 1 Industrial and Simulactive webinar today. My name is Olivia Link and I'm a Phase 1 Aerial System Sales Manager and I'm here with Simon Grandine of SimActive. Today's webinar will focus on SimActive's Correlator 3D workflow using medium format imagery from the Phase 1 IXMRS 150 megapixel camera. Please feel free to ask any questions and, and enter on the GoToMeeting panel, and they will be answered at the end of the presentation. Also, this and many other webinars are available on the Phase 1 Industrial website in the download section. Next slide. Shown here is the four band RGB system with the SOMAG and a Planix AVX210. The Aplanix Pause AVX210 offers a direct georeferencing solution for improved efficiency and high accuracy mapping with small and medium format digital cameras. The four band system can easily be installed at under 25 minutes and weighs about 45 pounds. Next slide. Displayed is the phase one workflow, IX Plan, IX Flight, and IX Capture. After the mission is complete, the images and pause data are ready for processing in IX Capture and a Planix pause pack. TIFFs, EO, ground control, and camera calibration can then be imported into SimActive's Correlator 3D. Next slide. The data set that we'll be reviewing today consisted of four flight lines at 9.2 centimeter GSD and 4,000 feet AGL. There was a total of 60 images, which totaled in 20 gigabytes after processing to TIFF. The raw IQ to TIFF processing took one hour and 15 minutes. The lens distortion was not removed from the images. And now over to Simon to take you through the SimActive workflow. All right, thank you very much, Olivia, for that. Uh, hi, everyone. So my name is Simon Grande, and I'm a photogrammetric specialist here at SimActive. So today, uh, we will go through the workflow of processing phase one industrial cameras. Uh, and show you uh, the capacity of uh, Correlator 3D uh, software. So today, what you will learn is you'll learn a bit about SimActive and what we do. Um, I'll also present the workflow uh, of, uh, of processing phase one uh, images. Uh, I'll talk more specifically uh, about the aerial triangulation modules, how to generate accurate uh, surface model and terrain model how to create uh, some seamless ortho mosaic, also how to assess the quality uh, of, your, uh, of your output data. And finally, I'll talk a bit about the licensing options that we have and uh, about uh, trying out our software uh, and so on. Uh, so about SimActive, uh, so SimActive is a company based in Montreal, Canada. Uh, we're the, a leading developer of photogrammetry software since 2003. Um, we are the first GPU-based uh, software, so most of our processing is done uh, on the graphic, uh, on, on the GPU. Uh, however, we still use a, a big part of the CPU for the processing. Um, and we also uh, continually innovating with, uh, correlator, uh, with our Correlator 3D product. Uh, we first uh, were a software to process a large format and medium format camera. And then we uh, integrate the, the drone imagery um, later on in our development. Uh, so for us, uh, processing a different types of camera uh, is something that we're used to. Uh, and uh, I'll show you uh, the workflow uh, to process your phase one imagery in a correlator treaty. Um, our clients, so today we're based in more than 100 countries. Uh, we have customers from the military sector, from the government sector. We also have some blue chip companies um, and uh, based in North America, in Europe, in Asia, uh, in Australia. Um, and so today, uh, so as I said, the, the topic of my presentation will be how to process uh, phase one uh, 100 megapixel or 150 megapixel cameras uh, in Correlator 3D. So the following uh, workflow will be suggested for my presentation. So I'll talk about uh, the AT part at first, so how to extract tie points between your images, how to assess the accuracy with the, G the GCPs and checkpoint tagging. Um, I'll also talk about uh, the options that we have for the bundle adjustment to make sure that we have a one good single solution 
for, for your whole project. Uh, later on, I'll talk about how to generate accurate uh, surface model and also point cloud uh, and how to transpose uh, this surface model to a, a digital terrain model. I also talk a bit about our uh, demo editing modules will give you the flexibility to, uh, to edit uh, your results so you make sure that uh, all the data that you're producing is at, is at uh, your expectation. Uh, I'll talk about the ortho rectification of single imagery uh, up to the uh, creation of the seamless uh, mosaic and also talk about how to edit uh, your mosaic with our uh, seamline editing modules and also playing with the color adjustment of your uh, of your mosaic. So first, um, how to perform uh, an aerial triangulation in coral literature. So uh, as I will do from my presentation, I will uh, I will talk a bit about uh, the subject and then I will jump into the software to do a, uh, a small practical uh, demonstration to really show you uh, what is behind coral literature. Um, so basically the aerial triangulation consists of two steps. So the first step is basically integrating all your images in a single block. So finding common features uh, between all your images. And from those common features, we'll be able to transpose them uh, with GCPs to make sure that everything fits together uh, in, a, in one single scene uh, to make sure uh, that, um, that you have a great accuracy mapping product. Uh, the aerial triangulation is also the most critical steps uh, of photogrammetry processing because everything uh, relies on the position uh, of your images and also on the uh, on the calibration of your of your sensor. So we'll show you what what are the options that you have uh, with Correlator 3D and how you could uh, really uh, get the best out of your data possible. So if I show you in Correlator 3D how it looks. So basically here, uh, what you have is you have the, uh, the interface uh, of Correlator 3D. So you have, um, you will have uh, a base map with uh, basically uh, all your flight lines together. So as Olivia said before, we have four flight lines and those little triangle correspond to the checkpoints and the GCPs of my project. Um, so uh, the software is, is, uh, is made to be quite intuitive for the user. Um, so we have different processing options uh, up to the uh, one click button solution if you really want to, to do a quick processing or you could go module by module which we usually suggest to our customer to make sure that you really have the full control over your data. And also we offer uh, the possibility to run everything in script via command line uh, so, could, so everything could be run without loading the graphical user interface. Um, so uh, as I was talking of the aerial triangulation, the first step uh, of the aerial triangulation is to compute the tie points between the images. So um, the first step is that the software will, will find uh, common features between the software, which will be displayed uh, with those little lines. So all those little lines correspond uh, to links between the images. Uh, as we can see here, uh, with a really great flight configuration, we're, we're able to get a, a good stable block of images, um, which is a critical part for the aerial triangulation. So all my images are, are well tied together, uh, and this is a, a key part for, uh, the, for the accuracy of the, uh, of the uh, aerial triangulation. Once your tie points are extracted, uh, you'll be able to import uh, your ground control points or your checkpoint to make sure that you have a really good uh, absolute accuracy over your, um, over your whole block uh, of images. So basically, uh, in, this in this project, uh, if my memory is good, we had 16 ground control points. Uh, for, the, for, the for the purpose of the, of the demonstration, they were split in two. So half were used as ground control points and the other half was used as checkpoint. So the checkpoints are only there to validate uh, the overall accuracy uh, of the bundle adjustment to make sure that um, the solution that we have at the end really reflects uh, the accuracy that we want to reach with our mapping product. Um, without a good aerial triangulation, well, all the uh, accuracy of the other uh, mapping products such as your uh, DM 
or your Oracle mosaic and will be impacted. So it's really, uh, it's really uh, critical to pass a bit more time on the aerial triangulation and make sure uh, that you have a, a good solution. So uh, in the software, you'll be able to import your uh, ground control points or your checkpoint. It, it could be imported as a text file. So you'll need to have a text file which corresponds with a GCP's ID, uh, easting, northing, and then elevation, um, and then elevation uh, for each ground control points. Once uh, they will be imported in the software, you will see little triangles for the GCPs and two triangles for the checkpoints. Um, and then you'll be able to tag your GCPs on your images to make sure uh, that you have uh, that, that they're well tagged together. So as an example, if I select a checkpoint here, uh, I will be able to have uh, the coordinates of my ground control of my ground control points or my checkpoints here. And by zooming in onto the specific images, I will be able uh, to properly tag my ground control points uh, where they correspond. Uh, with this slide, we also add access uh, to images that were showing the location uh, of the of the ground control point. This really helps us to to tag uh, properly tag the ground control points. Um, also, depending on the accuracy of the uh, instrument that you use for your ground control points, you could be able you could uh, you could uh, specify a different uncertainty. Uh, for each of your point or for the whole the whole uh, the whole ground control points uh, by adding a, a specific value uh, here. So you could say, uh, oh, I have a, a much more uncertainty in uh, in, in elevation, so I'll, I'll maybe add uh, five centimeters. In this case, uh, all the the sources was pretty much precise, so we were we were able to fit a good aerial triangulation uh, solution. Uh, without playing with uh, the uncertainty of the uh, of the uh, ground control points or checkpoints. So once your ground control points uh, and checkpoints are tagged, it's at this time where you will refine uh, the position of the, of the EOs and uh, the distortion of the camera to make sure that everything's uh, fit well together and you have a good solution. Um, to do so, uh, in Correlative 3D, we have different options. So we have breakdown uh, during the bundle adjustment in four four categories, uh, but basically three are three of them are really important during the uh, bundle adjustment process. So the first one is how you want to adjust uh, your exterior orientation adjustment. So uh, for this uh, adjustment, we have different options. So uh, we have actually five options. The first one is if you already have an AT that's done uh, on your uh, on your exterior orientation, or you can leave it as none and only do a camera calibration uh, for some reason. Also, uh, you could do simply a bore side calibration, which which will calibrate uh, your image block and will do a translation or a rotation uh, of your full block of images over your ground control points. We also have uh, the options of uh, the full AT constraint. So if you know uh, in this case where your uh, EOs are quite accurate and you want to leave uh, the software within within some uh, uncertainty, you'll be able to select the the AT the full AT constraint, and then uh, in the bundle adjustment parameters, you'll be able to specify the uncertainty that you want to apply uh, for each. Uh, for each parameters, for the x, the y, the z, the omega, phi, kappa. So basically, this is uh, how much you tell the software uh, for each images. That's the maximum uh, I would like to move my images uh, from the x, y, z, omega, phi, kappa. Uh, so it's really, it's really there where you can tell the software that my EOs are quite accurate, and I really want to find a solution within uh, those uncertainty. Uh, also, the um, uncertainty values. Uh, represent uh, so the unit represents the projection of your project. So if you use a projection in uh, a state plate projection in feet, well the uncertainty here will be in feet. Or if you use it uh, a UTM projection which in meter, well the uncertainty will be in meter. Same thing with the omega phi kappa. Usually uh, the uncertainty will be in uh, in degrees. The other um, options that we have is we have the 
a full unconstrained uh, method, which is basically you tell the software that I don't really know uh, how accurate my uh, EOs are, uh, but uh, let's find a solution uh, within the, within what's possible. So basically, this is an option uh, we suggest when customers are processing UAV data and the accuracy uh, of the GPS and IMU uh, are not really known. So you really want to move your images to make sure you find the best solution possible for your ET. And finally, the last option that you have for your EOs adjustment is basically the direct georeferencing option. The direct georeferencing option is uh, it's con consisting of not playing with the X, Y, and Z values of each images. We're only going to optimize uh, the omega C kappa angle just to move a bit the images, but uh, assuming that the initial position that you feed in the software um, are uh, highly accurate. Uh, also, at this point, if uh, any post uh, process needs to be done on your EO, uh, they need to be done prior to be imported in the software because the software will use the initial value that you feed it into the software uh, for generating the bundle adjustment. So um, the next uh, adjustment that you could do uh, is basically the sensor calibration, which consists of trying to um, to uh, to refine the position, uh, to refine the, the camera parameters uh, and the distortion of the camera of the parameters. Um, also, uh, phase one camera are, are provided with uh, ca a calibration reports, uh, which is a good uh, starting point for the software. So when you will create your project, you could use uh, this calibration report. Uh, as an example here, um, you will have access uh, to different uh, type of, of calibration. So you have three different, uh, three different types of calibration, such as the Australian, the Info, and the USGS. Our software is, is using the USGS uh, calibration. So uh, at this point, you have the starting uh, the starting uh, points for your calibration, such as the the height and width of the sensor, uh, the principle, the the pixel size, the focal, the calibrated focal length, uh, the principal point, and also uh, a beginning of the of those uh, radial distortion parameters, which can also be optimized uh, slightly to ref to uh, to make sure that everything uh, fits well with all your images. Uh, so at this point, if you leave it as unconstrained, well, the software will fully have the possibility to, to, uh, to calibrate the 12 model parameters, which, can, which uh, is including the K and the P parameters. Uh, also, if you, if you know that some of those values are highly accurate, you can leave it as constrained and only optimize uh, certain uh, certain parameters of your sensor, such as uh, the missing uh, distortion. So you can leave uh, the focal length to its initial values uh, from the, well, the, the calibration reports uh, and start with only the missing, uh, the missing parameters uh, at the end. And uh, if you already have a calibration report where all the, uh, all the distortion are already uh, are already predefined. Well, you can you can leave it as none, so the software won't play with the camera calibration, and we'll use it as is uh, to compute its bundle uh, its bundle adjustment. Finally, the last step is uh, if you want to integrate some ground control points in your uh, aerial triangulation solution. So based uh, on this solution, uh, you'll be able to select your ground control points uh, or Sometimes uh, it could be done in two uh, in two steps. So the first step could be uh, only uh, the EOs and the sensor, and the second step could be adding up the uh, ground control point solution um, to make sure that you have a good uh, AT possible. So when uh, your aerial triangulation is uh, is done, you will see that you'll you'll have uh, on your project sheet a step one. Um, a step one solution that's done. Uh, you could run as many steps as you want. However, uh, when you run a uh, different step, well, it's always going to use the previous step to generate the next one. So if you're using this uh, a new step as a step two, well, the, the, 
the, the beginning value will be from the step one and the step one, the beginning values are used from the initial parameters. So uh, you could run multiple bundle adjustments, uh, but usually with one or maximum two bundle adjustments, you should find something uh, that's quite accurate and you'll, you'll be able uh, to really uh, assess the quality of the um, of the uh, of your data. Once your error triangulation is done, uh, we generate a PDF report, uh, which which will explain you uh, more of uh, how well the error triangulation was done. So we have on the first page a summary of the um, of the of the the error triangulation, such as the uh, number of images, uh, the projection of the project. We also gonna have uh, the quality assessment for the tie point. So this basically tell much how well is the relative accuracy of your block is, uh, and uh, so basically you want to have uh, as as low uh, error as possible. Then if you're using uh, ground control points or checkpoints, you could assess the accuracy of those checkpoints uh, with the uh, statistic that you have over here. So you have the uh, X and Y error, the uh, RMSC. Uh, an elevation error. You also have this, the error projected in a pixel, um, in a pixel, and you have the numbers of GCPs that were used. And same thing here. So you have the number of checkpoints that were used. On the second page of your quality report, well, you have the parameters that were used uh, for the uh, bundle adjustment. So um, you'll have the, the the parameters that were used for the camera, and also. Uh, the uh, the EO adjustment that were used for uh, the bundle adjustments and the same thing for the the ground reference. So basically, uh, if you don't remind uh, all the parameters that were used, you could always go back to your quality report and make sure that uh, to look at the parameters that were used. Um, then you have the previous and uh, after the bundle adjustment. So you have the uh, the initial uh, solution. And then the solution where all the parameters were uh, were slightly optimized, uh, and basically the green dots mean that uh, the residual error that we found between all the images is below 0.75 pixel, which is a highly accurate solution for your uh, for such project. Uh, then also here you will you will see um, basically how much we play with the EO ad adjustments. It also includes uh, the bore side calibration at this point. Uh, so you have uh, basically the, the average position in X, Y, Z, and also the maximum position we did uh, move the images. Uh, same thing for the uh, attitude angle, so the omega T kappa angle. Uh, also, in other reports, uh, we also uh, tell the user uh, the individual adjustment we did for each images. So sometimes if an image is moved too much, well, you could troubleshoot your project by going into some specific, uh, into some specific file. And then here uh, you have the sensor calibration uh, that was applied to the, um, to the project. And finally, you have basically the control point analysis. So uh, how well your control points or your checkpoints were tagged uh, what's the RMSE of those uh, of those uh, ground source? And then here you have all your uh, GCPs individually and uh, and their errors. So you're if you want to to really see the accuracy of one specific ground control points, um, you could uh, you could also uh, look by here. And at the last page, basically you have uh, the uh, system information that was used uh, for processing such project. Uh, and at the end of my presentation, I will show you the timing that we, that it took to process those 60 images and break down module by module uh, and break down module by module. Um, so once you're comfortable with your uh, aerial triangulation uh, solution, you'll be able to generate a highly accurate surface model and terrain model. So the software works in a raster based approach. So we will generate a raster D DSM, which from there we'll be able to extract a terrain model by removing uh, cars, buildings, uh, trees, and other, uh, and other elements uh, to make sure that you have uh, highly accurate orthophotos. Uh, in the meantime, when you're generating your surface model, 
you can also generate a point cloud which will be stored in the LAS format and they will also be colorized with the color uh, of the uh, of the imagery. So uh, by default, Correlator 3D have different options for the uh, DSM and DTM extraction. So for the DSM extraction, uh, we have uh, our optimal resolution is usually five times the ground sample distance of your images. So let's say you have an image at five centimeters. Well, the software will propose you uh, uh, raster uh, surface model at 25 centimeters. However, when you have a high quality data with uh, like phase one imagery, you could lower down this resolution maybe to three times the ground sample distance of your imagery. So um, you could use, uh, let's say if you have a five centimeters imagery, you could go up to 15, uh, 15 centimeters, which is a good compromise between the accuracy and also the processing speed uh, of uh, of processing this data. Once uh, you have generated your surface model, you'll be able to uh, to to do an automatic extraction of digital terrain model. So uh, as I said, it's a tool that will remove uh, cars, buildings, or trees. And on this terrain model, you'll be able to generate uh, your ortho photos. But you can also generate your own ortho photos. Uh, from your uh, surface model if you if you want to generate some true ortho photos. Um, and and uh, at every time, you could also edit the result uh, of your DSM or your DTM to make sure that uh, you have the, hi the, the highest accurate possible results. Uh, so before generating uh, a, su a surface model, you could uh, sometimes uh, mask out the water body areas to make sure that all the small noise is removed. Uh, you, could, you could draw some exclusion zones. So if you know that some areas uh, need to be uh, intact, they could be used uh, for the DTM extraction. So if I show you in the software how, uh, how it looked, well, basically, uh, when you're done, you're, you're done your AT, you'll be able to generate uh, your surface model. So the software will estimate the resolution uh, of your um, of your uh, surface model, and it will it will give you uh, the possibility to to uh, to edit the values and specify what is the resolution you want to use for your um, for your uh, output surface model. So in this case, uh, I we have used I think three times the ground sample distance uh, of the imagery uh, since the uh, aerial triangulation results that we had were highly accurate. Uh, and we were confident that uh, with such resolution, it was a good compromise between speed uh, and accurate results in order to generate uh, also high accurate terrain model, but also uh, ortho photos and a seamless mosaic. So as you can see here, you have a, a DSM generation window. So uh, by default, it's the optimal resolution that is done, but you could also uh, select the maximal button, which the maximal is basically a one-to-one -one resolution, which sometimes brings a bit too much noise in the output. Um, so we really suggest to use the maximal button and take this value and multiply it by three. So in this case, it would be 27.9. Uh, so you could round it up to probably 30 centimeters if you want to have something uh, that's quite um, that's quite normalized. And you could also uh, as you can also uh, play with the uh, vertical accuracy of your project. So if you if you want if you don't need something that's really highly accurate but you want a much quicker result, uh, you could downgrade a bit the uh, vertical accuracy uh, of your uh, vertical of your vertical uh, DSM. Um, also, if you have some 3D constraint, which could be uh, 3D shape files such as break lines for the DSM or the DTM generation, you could use them during um, this uh, this step. So let's say you have uh, you have polygons which water bodies uh, are already digitized. You could import them, and then the software, when generating the um, surface model, will flat out automatically the um, the water body area. And also, you have the the, the, the generate uh, point cloud checkbox. By default, it's not checked, but if you want, uh, you could later on. Uh, Generate a point cloud at the same time of the ground of the uh, surface model. 
So as a result, uh, you will have something like this. So you will have a, a raster uh, surface model, which will correspond to everything that you see on your images. So, um, and from this uh, raster uh, surface model, we are able to, to derive a terrain, a terrain model. So uh, as I said earlier, our terrain model is, a, is an automatic tools uh, to generate um, to generate terrain model. So um, you could add a few constraints to the uh, uh, terrain extraction, such as 3D break lines. So if you already have uh, break lines that were vectorized uh, with stereo vision software, you could use them uh, and and bring them in the software to. Uh, to make sure that they follow the, the terrain the terrain feature, or let's say if you want to keep uh, bridges into your uh, into your terrain model, you can draw some polygons over uh, over some area and use them as exclusion zone. So basically, the exclusion zone will tell the software that everything that's inside this polygon uh, will be you will, will will not be taken off from the surface model and will be seen into the uh, into the terrain model. Uh, also, we have our, our, a dam editing module, which uh, really gives the user the full possibility to uh, edit his, his, um, his output. So let's say I want to remove only uh, certain elements, such as, um, such as uh, let's say I want to remove uh, uh, this house here, so I could go into the, uh, into the dam editing modules, and I could, I could quickly draw a polygon over this specific house. This, and then uh, I could uh, I could delete this specific house uh, without uh, affecting the rest of the um, the rest of uh, my surface model. Uh, and also, if you're not uh, if you're willing to go back into the, uh, the edition, or all the history is stored, uh, all the history of the modification is stored. So I could just go quickly back, and then my house will be bring back to my surface model. Um, and also, this is the same thing for the DTM. So, if you want to, uh, if you want to edit parts of your DTM, you'll be able to use the DEM editing modules to make sure that uh, you have the highest accurate possible results. Um, so, uh, as I said, there's a terrain model that that is extracted from the uh, surface model. So, uh, as we said here, uh, there. In this case, we had some bridge over uh, our um, our surface model, and we can see that during the um, during the uh, terrain extraction, well, the bridge were kept intact. Uh, and so, when we'll do the ortho rectification based on our terrain model, well, all our bridge will, will be per, uh, perfectly ortho rectified. Um, so now, since we have both sources of data, we have the terrain. The terrain and the surface model. Uh, the user has the possibility to select which sources he wants to use for the ortho rectification uh, of this of his um, of his different uh, his, di his different uh, ortho photos. Finally, the last thing I would like to show you uh, from the elevation perspective is basically we generate a point cloud. Uh, if you want, if you want to generate a point cloud, so the point cloud could be viewed in 3D. So you could go into the into a 3D screen uh, like this, and you'll be able to pan into your uh, your 3D point cloud, which will uh, show, uh, which will be stored in a LAS format, and will also contain the RGB information uh, for uh, for for every point. So once uh, you're satisfied with your elevation data and your surface uh, model data, you'll be able to generate uh, seamless or uh, ortho mosaic. So for creating a seamless ortho mosaic, there's it's it's a two process. It's a two process. Um, so basically, uh, the first the first step is to generate um, is to generate single ortho photos for each images. And then take everything, uh, all uh, take all the uh, different ortho photos and generate a seamless mosaic. Uh, so you'll be able to do some uh, some mapping product with it, um, and so and, and so on. 
So uh, by default, the, the, the user will, uh, the software will uh, generate the uh, ortho photo at uh, the full resolution of the input imagery. You can also change the resolution of the uh, input imagery uh, depending on, on your output needs or uh, on your processing needs. So if you want to have a quicker result, just a, a, with a coarse view, you could uh, generate some coarser uh, ortho photos. Uh, also, a great thing uh, with with such uh, with with the software is when you're mapping really really big big areas and you don't want to process all your data to get uh, uh, at at one time. You only want to process a sub part of your uh, of your of your area. Well, you could only select a small section of your project and only generate those uh, orthos from this section and also the mosaic for this section. So you could. At the same time, you can deliver subsection of your uh, of your project. Sometimes it's much more efficient, uh, also for QCs because you can do your QCs on smaller section uh, instead of doing it on a full section, which could sometimes take more time. And by doing it on subject subsection at this uh, at different time, well, it could uh, it could give you a, a flow of, of deliverables uh, to your customers uh, without having to only generate one big file um, and then give it to, your, to, the, out, to the final customers. Also, during the uh, ortho, uh, ortho photos uh, creation uh, and the mosaic creation, the software will do a color adjustment between all the images. So we make sure that uh, when two ortho photos uh, that overlapping each other, it will be look like one. So there's, there, all the colors will be adjusted uh, and at the end, you, you should not see you should not see any seam line between uh, all your ortho photos. So if I show you how it looks in the software, so basically, um, once you want to generate uh, your ortho photos, you'll be able uh, to generate the uh, ortho photos um, menu, which will ask you uh, what's the resolution you want to generate uh, your ortho your ortho photos. Uh, and also will give you, um, so you will ask you the, the uh, output resolution that you want. By default, as I said, it's the optimal resolution, so the initial uh, resolution of the input imagery. Uh, if you want, you could check the DSM base, um, the DSM base, if you want to generate some true ortho. Uh, you could also, if you generate some true ortho, then you have access to uh, 3D vectors with the, with the building roofs. With the building roof, you could you could use them uh, during the ortho rectification, so it will be much more better for the true ortho generation. You could play with the overlap that you want to uh, that you want uh, to use for the uh, for the ortho photo. So if you want to have smaller ortho photos uh, on this, you you could crop them with a with a height and width factor, which could be maybe 10%. So it, it should be much more also quicker to process, uh, and it will be uh, it will be uh, a bit a bit less heavier uh, on your uh, on your disk so once your ortho your ortos uh, are generated uh, you will have a, uh, you will have uh, all the individual ortho images um, into uh, this into the software so as i could see here i see basically uh, all the individual images uh, that were ortho rectified and from there, I'll be able to use them to generate uh, a seamless mosaic. So for the for the mosaic, uh, the user has a few uh, has a few options. So basically, the first um, the first option is if you want to use uh, a tiling definition, if you want to subset uh, your 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 big mosaic into smaller section, you can import a, a shape file, and it will. It will break down your uh, your final mosaic into subsection, uh, which could be also um, which could be also uh, better for uh, for the mosaic edition. You also have the possibility to edit uh, the feathering size, which is basically how much pixels are taken in account uh, when we blending two or two photos together. So how much pixel of each uh, of each images we're taking uh, to blend the same line between two images. You could also uh, color balance your uh, your or your your uh, your final mosaic, and we also have the nadir optimization, which is usually uh, much more for the UAV project. 
but uh, when some camera has high uh, radial distortion uh, and you want to only keep the, the the nadir part of the imagery well by using by checking this uh, this box you'll have the possibility uh, to only keep the, the much more nadir part of each uh, of the imagery but in this case uh, you could uncheck uh, the box and so finally the 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 output uh, will be um, will be a final seamless mosaic and then from this mosaic you can pan into uh, this mosaic to really see how accurate are the GCPs uh, you had previously tagged uh, in the project. So you could uh, you'll be able to to pan and, and see uh, how well uh, those those ground control points uh, were actually tagged. So in this case, it was the right the, the the corner of the of the of the of the sidewalk here. So I have uh, I could do a, an accuracy assessment uh, of my output by panning into my mosaic and uh, if you want you could also edit the seam line of your uh, of your project so uh, with our um, mosaic editing modules you'll be able to uh, load your mosaic block and from there you'll be able uh, to to edit uh, the seam line uh, of the of the of the mosaic so i could i could uh, let's say select an, an area like this and then by selecting this area, I could only uh, select a few vertices. And then uh, I could quickly see the changes on, uh, on, the, on the mosaic and then save it only for this, um, for this uh, section. And then once I've did all my modification for uh, my mosaic, I'll just have to, uh, to, say, to apply the final, um, the final output uh, the final modification to, to uh, the output. Um, also, what you, uh, what you could do is you could also play with the, the, the histogram uh, modification. So if, if you want to stretch out uh, the histogram to add uh, a bit more, um, play with the green, the red, or the blue band of your, of your final mosaic, uh, you should be able to, uh, to play with the, uh, the color histogram uh, for individual band, but also the tree band at the same uh, at the at the same at the same time. So you'll be able um, you'll be able to see uh, to quickly see uh, the histogram of the color, uh, of the the mosaic. And you could quickly see basically by playing only with the gamma. You'll be able to see the changes of your uh, of your mosaic. And this is only a preview uh, adjustment. Uh, as long as you're not clicking on process, there's nothing that's been applied on the final uh, on the final mosaic. And finally, uh, the mosaic is uh, exported into a GeoTIFF format and a GeoTIFF format, uh, which could be used in many GIS software uh, such as QGIS for further analysis. So finally. Uh, as I said, for creating a seamless ortho mosaic, uh, you'll be able to edit your seam line to play with the color adjustment. So we really want to give the user the full possibility to edit uh, is, is all his seam line and to make sure that you have the best result possible. Um, also, uh, by assessing the quality of your result, you make sure that when a project is delivered, you make sure that everything is, uh, you, have a, you have a nice, um, you have nice results to give to your, your, your customers. So you can validate by panning into your mosaic on your checkpoints and on your GCPs. Um, or also you can look at your quality report, which will give you uh, a numbers uh, or uh, what, how precise is your final output. Uh, you can also use external source for validation. So if you have, uh, let's say, uh, some, some uh, some points that were not used for the calibration, you could use them for the um, for the final accuracy assessment of your mosaic, and you could also pan uh, to your on your on your mosaic to assess the radiometric quality uh, of your mosaic. So to finish my presentation, I'll uh, I'll just um, show you uh, some unique benefits that Correlator 3D has. Uh, so basically. Uh, the processing speed is our main advantage. Uh, most of the processing is done on the GPU, uh, on the GPU 
parts, uh, but also the CPU is mainly used for other uh, modules. Uh, but uh, we, uh, we are really focusing on processing speed and accuracy of the results. Um, there's no really training that's required to use the software. It's kind of, a, it's kind of a, an intuitive solution. Uh, we have unlimited numbers of images can be processed on a single standard PC. Um, we have customers that have processed uh, over 20,000 images of 250 megapixels on a single uh, on a single PC. And also you could uh, batch process um, all your project with command line uh, with command line script. Uh, and we could also integrate uh, correlator 3D on uh, AWS or Azure instance uh, if it's required. And now if I break down uh, just a bit the timing that it took for this for uh, for this process for this project actually so we had um, here we'll see uh, module by module how much time it took so it took uh, nearly uh, two hours and 30 minutes to process those 60 images and this is without uh, the um, edition the manual edition time uh, it's only processing time but we could see for 60 images uh, of uh, 150 megapixel. Well, it's quite fast to process uh, such uh, such projects. So we had 12 minutes, almost 13 minutes for the tie points, one minute uh, one minute for the bundle. Uh, it took uh, an hour and a half for the DSM generation, including the the, the point cloud generation. It took uh, nearly four minutes for the the DDM extraction, uh, and around 40 minutes uh, for the the auto rectification and the mosaic creation to get. Uh, with 16 ground control points, and basically it was done on a on a on a processing computer with a good graphic with a uh, a quite good graphic card, but it was not a, a super power computer. Uh, and also one other thing that's quite important with our software is you re you will really uh, see the difference when using a, a SSD drive, since it will really accelerate the write and read speed uh, of the uh, of the output of your project. Uh, so finally, we have uh, different uh, licensing options. So we offer uh, different types of license. So we have, an, uh, we have a UAV license, we have a medium format license, and we also have a, a full format license. So the UAV is up to 50 megapixel. Uh, the medium format license is up to 103 megapixel. So it includes the, the 100 megapixels from phase one, and, the, and there's no limit for the full format imagery. Um, we also have, uh, as I said, a monthly subscription for all of those. Uh, we also have the yearly or the permanent, uh, and we also offer the possibility of a node lock license or a single on a single PC, or we also uh, offer the possibility of a floating license, uh, depending uh, on your needs. If you want to get started with Correlator 3D, well, we offer um, free processing for marketing purposes, so we could. Uh, we could process small data set to show you what the software could do with your own data. Uh, and we also offer free trial if you want to test out from your side uh, correlator 3D. All you have to do is contact us at sell at semactive.com or visit our website, which is www.semactive.com. So from my side, uh, it's done. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, now we will have time for a few questions. All right, well, thank you very much, Simon. There are a few questions, and if you're ready, I'll start reading them to you. Uh, the yeah. first one is, is it possible to disable images in a project and have them excluded from the AT process, or does a new project have to be created without those specific images? Uh, for the AT, uh, for the AT pro uh, processes, it, it will include all the images that were uh, stored in the, at the creation of the project. So if you if you put down 100 images at the project creation, we will use them all. But for the DSM, the ortho or the mosaic creation, you could select only sub section. But for the AT, we will use all the images. All right. Okay. And then next, let's see. Um, the supplied camera calibration. Why was it necessary to calibrate the sensor during AT? Are those calibration parameters 
easily used in another package if needed without further correction? Uh, it could be used. It's, it's, we, we usually uh, recommend doing a, ca a camera calibration within Correlator 3D. Sometimes it helps us to uh, achieve uh, slightly a third, one of third of pixel to make sure that everything fits well together. Uh, but if you, if you already have a solid camera calibration, you could probably uh, do your AT without doing uh, a camera calibration. You could only do a, a NEO adjustment uh, with your ground control points. Okay, thank you. Um, we have three more questions, but uh, the next one is, bridges were left in the surface. Were they initially removed when processing from DSM to DTM, or were they added back to the DTM after being removed from the DSM? Um, well, in this case, uh, what it was done is uh, to make sure that they were kept in the terrain model, we did use some exclusion zones. So, so in the dem editing modules, prior to the DTM extraction, we draw some polygons around the bridges. And so we told the software uh, not to remove those areas during the DTM extraction, so they, they could be kept into the terrain uh, final output. So it requires a bit of, uh, of manual editing, uh, but uh, it's not quite long. Okay. Um, all right, and the next one, when processing a four-band phase one industrial set of TIFF files, is it necessary to first co-register the images? And that will be one for Lewis, the technical manager of phase one to respond. And Jeff, I'll have him send you an email to answer that because I do not know that myself. All right, and then the next. Hello. Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, let's see. The next question. Um, for calibration of interior orientation parameters, camera calibration, do you require data from two altitudes? Uh, well, not really. We, can, we So basically, the minimum requirements that we need is we usually uh, suggest three different flight lines that looking into the, into a different direction. That's the minimal usually requirement to have a good uh, interior orientation calibration. But it could be from the same altitude, um, and it should not really much affect the output of the calibration. All right, and then finally. Um, this project was processed in 8.3.4. What yes. in inefficiency would you expect from the latest version of the software? Um, basically, uh, for those type of images, uh, we could probably see a big improvement from the uh, orthophotos and the mosaic um, and the mosaic creation, as well as the tie point extraction. Um, it's hard for me to say how much time, but uh, it it should be a, a big improvement because uh, on our latest uh, version, basically uh, all the uh, the process uh, or the, the the computer uh, hardware is really much optimized. So we'll use as much as possibility or as much as possible processing uh, powers that we have to generate those products. Uh, so. Um, so in, in some cases, I've seen uh, around 50% increasement. It really depends on your on your processing hardware. But uh, the key part here is really having a SSD drive, which is the main focus with our 8.4 version. It will uh, it will quietly accelerate the processing time of your project. Okay. Well, there are no more questions, and I think conclude today's webinar. Again, this will be posted on the Phase 1 Industrial website. You scroll to the bottom of the homepage. The webinar library is available there for this and many other webinars. And Simon, um, thank you very much for your time today. We really appreciate it. And if anybody else has questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to us at the Phase 1 website. Thanks and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.